Hey everyone, welcome to the Dapper community call. It is November 30th, 2021, and we have a couple of things on the agenda to discuss today. So we'll show you real quick. Um, first, we're gonna have Yaron talk to us about the configuration building block that was released as a part of version 1.5. And then we also have Bernd who's going to talk to us about uh, managing Cosmos DB connections in production. And then as always, we'll have an open discussion at the end for any questions or items that uh, you would like to address. And I just realized I didn't introduce myself in the beginning. My name is Will. I am an approver in the Dapper Docs repo. All right, so without further ado, let's uh, go over to the configuration building block. Your own, do you want to take over? Yep, let me uh, share my screen. And let me know once you can see it. I can see it. Okay, so let's see a demo of the configuration API. I know we talked about it um, at some other uh, community call and we basically discussed about what it is and what it can give you, but we didn't really show you how to use it. Um, now the configuration API is currently uh, at an alpha state, which means it's not recommended for production. And um, there is a, a bunch of fixes that are going on. For example, we discovered a, a bug today um, that, that we need to fix. Uh, and one of the endpoints is actually now working for the 1.5 release. And I'm gonna talk about that in a sec. Um, but the configuration API is, is really um, pretty much bare bones, but it's, it's pretty useful for developers, um, especially the watch API. And I'm gonna talk about that now. Um, another thing to notice is that it only supports gRPC at this point, so you don't have HTTP endpoints. Um, and we will have HTTP endpoints for it by the time it reaches a stable status, uh, hopefully. So let's take a look at how to use the configuration API um, from Go. Uh, this is a Go example, and uh, what, what can I do with it as a developer? So first of all, um, to use Dapper with gRPC, we're first establishing a gRPC connection. Uh, this is pretty bare bones. There is nothing Dapper about this. Uh, we're just instantiating a gRPC uh, context here and calling localhost, which is where my local Dapper sidecar is going to be running. And since I'm going to use the Dapper CLI, I'm going to get the Dapper gRPC port. Um, uh, hosted on my on my app, so I'm just going to reach out to uh, the environment variable, so that I know which uh, port to talk to Dapper on. Um, all this is is pretty standard. And then the next step is to create a Dapper client, right? So this Dapper client here basically gives us all of the Dapper API surface, which is awesome. Uh, you can use that from uh, any language um, that has gRPC support. Um, the way to generate those clients is uh, done by going into the Dapper repository and going into the Dapper directory, okay? Um, and let me just zoom in a bit. And uh, we have some instructions here on how to do that, depending on the language of your choice, um, the actual proto generation might change. The easiest thing to do would just be to go to um, the gRPC docs and they have really uh, easy, um, language specific tutorials for you to get started with. So if you're a gRPC developer, you already know this. If you're new to gRPC, um, it's pretty easy to just click on here um, and they have a quick search and basics tutorial and they basically walk you through how to take the proto files and generate them. Uh, so I did that for Go and I have the gRPC client here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is get a configuration item. Now, why would I wanna do that? Um, applications need configuration in most cases and Dapper now has an API to basically provide configurations to them. Now, what we have here is a get configuration alpha one method. Uh, the alpha one basically denotes that it's a method. So it's very explicit for you to know uh, that you know, the, the API surface here is not finalized in any way, it might change. It might break, but for now, uh, it's a pretty simple get request. Um, it has a store name, so we're going to talk to a configuration store named Redis, and we're going to get the key of a configuration item called a count name. Now, the configuration item, um, the configuration store for Dapper is this thing. It's a component. We have a new type here, so I defined configuration.redis. We have a Redis host. This is very similar to the state store configuration, and I don't have a Redis password. 
I'm just using the Redis Docker container that runs on my machine. So uh, we can see the name here is Redis and inside my Go code, I'm saying, hey, um, talk to the configuration store named Redis and get me this key. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm printing the key, the value and the version. So let's take a look at what Dapper actually returns to us. So once we get the configuration item back, if I'm looking at the list here, we get the key, which is uh, what we requested because we're getting an array of items here, right? So if we're iterating, iterating it, uh, we're getting basically getting the key uh, for the item. We're getting the value and we're getting a version. We'll get to version in a second here. Um, oh, by the way, we also get metadata. So if there's any special metadata that's returned, um, that'll be probably component specific. We're going to get uh, basically a map of string string um, here, a uh, map or hash set if you're Java or it's, it's going to be like an array in C sharp and whatever. Um, so here we're uh, basically just printing the key. So uh, let's do that. And you know, for, for the demo, just to keep it simple, uh, we will return here. And what I'm going to do now is go into my Redis CLI. So I'm connected into my local Redis store. Uh, if I do Docker PS, I can see that I have Redis up and running for 27 hours. Um, and what I can do now is do set. And oh, by the way, look at this amazing, um, look at this amazing autocomplete that, that we have here. Uh, that's quite awesome. So I'm going to do set and I'm going to set a key. So I'm going to set the key for account name and I'm going to set it as Wookie. Um, because we all like Wookiees. So, no, and I made a typo here. Do we move the redundant in? Yeah, okay. So uh, account name Wookiee, um, great. Let's do that, okay, awesome. And now I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna run this uh, small piece of app that's gonna talk to Dapper and get this using the Dapper CLI. So I'm gonna do Dapper on. I'm gonna give it an app idea of config demo. For those of you who don't know about the Dapper CLI, it's a local development helper tool that lets you run the Dapper sidecar and then your app. So I'm basically running um, the Dapper sidecar and then telling it to run my Go code here. Okay, so I'm basically just giving it an ID. And the only other thing is I'm pointing it at my components directory. That components directory holds the configuration.redis file. Um, this all uh, is available on our docs and um, most of the steps for this tutorial are also available, um, except for the configuration watch, which I'm gonna show in a second. But um, this is probably gonna get PR'd into the samples repository uh, next week. So you'll, you'll get to, to use this code too. Okay, so uh, let's launch that. And we can see that the sidecar is up and running. And uh, we can see that we got the key, which is account name and the value is Wookie. And there is no version because uh, we didn't actually write a version compliant key into the store. So this is pretty simple, right? Uh, this is pretty much like the state store um, implementation. And at this point, you will be looking at this and asking, hey, why can't I just use a state store uh, that you know I can, I can just get a key? Um, so, well, first of all, the configuration API uh, takes a, a bunch of keys, like an array of keys uh, to begin with, and it also returns you the version. So when we go forward, we will be adding more and more features onto the get configuration request API, um, which will basically make it much more distinct than the state store operation. So there's going to be like version uh, uh, filters on the API surface here and um, other uh, specific features uh, to do with configuration, even searching through documents, maybe that's now being discussed in the community. So the current version is very much like the state store, um, but there's going to be other stuff um, on here too. But you know, let's take a look at um, some of the uh, versioning uh, semantics that we have. So I'm going to set account name and I'm going to set it as Wookie. But uh, now, if if I'm just a developer inserting uh, any configuration item into the store, um, I can follow this format to basically specify a version for Dapper. So if I do it like that, and I basically specify um, this separator here and version 1.0, let's do that. And I'm going to run it again. I'm just running the exact same code now. And we will see that uh, now Dapper has extracted the version for us. So this is basically the version format. If you're a developer writing items into the configuration state store or an operator, if you follow um, this semantic, uh, Dapper will know how to extract the version. Um, and in a sec, I'll actually show you how to make changes and how Dapper is actually getting notified about new versions um, of the same configuration item if it changes. 
Uh, so um, that's pretty useful. And you can also attach metadata here and Depot will return it. It's also important to note that this point in time, we only support the Redis state store, but more, uh, sorry, Redis configuration store, but more configuration stores are coming. So uh, this is uh, pretty nice, but also pretty basic. Most of the times if I'm a developer, um, um, I won't get notified if a configuration item changes and then act accordingly, right? So what if my account name changes? Um, and for that specifically, we have another um, API version, which is subscribe configuration, um, which lets me subscribe to any changes that happen on the specific key that I'm requesting for the given store. So something that's pretty nice um, is how simple this API is. And uh, kudos to uh, Lawrence and, and also Sky from Alibaba um, for designing this. So we have the get configuration request here. And uh, it's pretty simple. We have the store name and the keys, and we basically take this, the exact same structure here and we just apply it to the subscription operation. So we're basically telling Dapper, hey, you want to subscribe to any updates that occur for the Redis configuration store and for uh, these keys. Uh, so we're just calling this API here, pretty similar to the get configuration one. We're airing out if there's panic. That's just standard Go stuff. And then this is how you consume uh, messages from the stream in Go. It's pretty similar for most other languages. We're just uh, foreign looping here. Um, we're receiving uh, updates from the uh, receive stream. This is the stream here. Uh, again, airing out if there is a panic and just examining the update. So if the update is not nil and if the items are not nil, then we're just printing out the change that occurred. Uh, here, I'm, I'm basically just uh, printing out the, uh, the first item on the list, but you can uh, just um, for loop the, the items here for all of the items that changed. Uh, by the way, you can also not uh, put in any keys here. And what this will do is it'll, it'll notify you of any change that occurs in the, in the configuration store. So any change to any key um, will basically get notified here. But here I'm just telling uh, the upper, hey, only notify me if there is any changes made to the account name key here. But again, if you omit this, it'll notify you basically for everything. So uh, let's see how um, that is done here. And we are going to basically uh, fire up the app again. So we are up and running. We can see that we have the uh, account name here. And uh, now I can basically start making changes to the API. So I can um, just make this change here, set it to uh, Wookie 2, and this is OK. And we can actually see that uh, we've got notified here twice uh, about the, uh, the change. So Dapper basically notified us, hey, uh, there is a change to this item here. Um, printing it out, and um, the, the for loop here should only print once. It's printing twice because it's repeating it, um, and uh, that's basically it. It's um, notifying you anytime there is a change to your configuration item here, uh, which is pretty cool because it's, it's a pretty nice thing to do um, to be able to just change stuff. This is actually the first API we have in Dapper that notifies you uh, when things are changing. Uh, I know lots of users want to see this for the state store, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell anyone who's seeing this right now, do not use this for state store configuration items. Um, this hasn't really been up to the level of scrutiny we would want it to be uh, for state store configuration items, meaning uh, there is no any special performance uh, related, you know, um, issues here that, that we were uh, looking at when we uh, received this PR. So this might be not as performant as you'd expect. This is really uh, good for configurations. Um, do not use it for you know, state because it might not have the latency you expect, even though this does look uh, pretty fast. We don't have benchmarks for this yet. So again, only use it for configuration. If you want to see something similar for the state APIs, uh, you know, raise an issue on GitHub or on Discord, and we can discuss this. Uh, but this is specifically for configuration. But this is again um, really cool. You know, if I, if I go and change the version here, uh, version two now and book three, then we can see that uh, we're getting notified about these changes again. And um, this is this is quite nice um, because the app can now basically uh, act on on the changes to the account name and do whatever it needs to do. And and this is of course. Um, 
really good for gRPC because it leverages client-side streaming. So you don't actually have to have a port open inside your app for Dapper to call back into you, right? So your application doesn't actually need to have anything open. You know, you don't need a gRPC server, you don't need an HTTP server because all you do is call this client-side streaming API and the Dapper sidecar will know to just notify you back um, just because this is how gRPC client-side streaming works. Um, so this is uh, pretty nice because you don't have to, you know, for example, lock down your gRPC server um, for only local host, you don't have to protect it with API tokens. You're only just calling the Dapper API server. Um, with the HTTP version of this, which is not yet implemented, you know, uh, we'll probably have the Dapper API call back into your application, just like we do with bindings and pub sub events, which will require you to open up an, an HTTP server. But um, just leveraging uh, gRPC client side streaming here is pretty nice. And, um, you know, on our uh, documentation, if, if you go to the Dapper Docs, um, let me open it here. So if you go to Docs and you can see, uh, let me zoom in a bit, uh, version 1.5, let me search for a configuration API. And um, you can, uh, whoa, not found. What did we do here? Um, I think we merged the PR today that removes the configuration API. That's interesting. Uh, docs maintainers, please uh, take note of that. Like if we um, remove the configuration API, that's, that's, that's not cool. So uh, I just clicked the first link here, which is the configuration overview. So it should be under developing applications, building blocks, uh, configuration here. And there you have the how to manage. So the content is still here. That's nice. So this is how you get to the content. It's developing applications, uh, building blocks, configuration, how to manage. And you can pretty much have um, most of what I've shown here on, on the demo with, with a bunch of languages. So we have Java here. You can see how to get configuration with Java, uh, .NET, Python, and, and JavaScript. But again, this is, you know, gRPC. So um, you'll have uh, the language of your choice generating the uh, Dapper product lines for um, whatever language you're actually using. Um, yeah, so I think this is it. Back to you and uh, ready to take questions. I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm good. Thank you, Yaron. Looks like uh, Mark has a question for you. I think Yaron answered it and he explained the gRPC functionality and how it works rather than having a, um, a callback method. Sounds great. All right, does anyone else have questions? What supported uh, configuration stores are there today and what ones are there planning to be? Uh, it's, it's Redis only for now. Um, I think there is a plan to add uh, NACOs um, and I think there's work going on there by the Alibaba folks. Um, not, not sure what else, like, um, so the, the community, you know, if you want to see your favorite config store support configuration, um, please just open an issue either in components contrib, uh, or, uh, Dapper Dapper. How many named Wookiees are there in the Star Wars universe, Burned asks. Um, good question. Um, I know about three personally. I, I assume there's more. Like if, if you're talking about Star Wars episodes four to six, I'm pretty sure there's only three. Um, if you're talking about the expanded universe and the comic books, um, there, there are probably a, a dozen more. Well, there's a population of millions. Yes, I know. Like, how many are, do we know of? I think he asked. Specifically, the name that I'm, when the name is mentioned. Um, so, yeah, how many unique names are there in the Star Wars books and movies and everything? Yeah. Yeah, that that looks looks to me like a core question, but we can we can definitely ask. I, uh, I actually have a question for you, Yaron. Um, you mentioned this is um, supported on gRPC right now. Are there plans to bring it to, uh, to, to enable it for HTTP as well? Yeah, so, well, there aren't currently plans, but you know, we've, we've made it very clear that 
um, the configuration API can only reach a stable state if it has an HTTP API too, right? So uh, like when I say there are no current plans, I mean, we haven't triaged the work into any milestone, okay? But there is like a, a roadmap plan to, to add HTTP for sure. Otherwise the API cannot go into stable. Sounds good, thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, Jerome, for showing us the demo and showing us the, this really cool new feature. Um, and for those of the, those of you watching, feel free to go into our docs and go read up on this new feature and try it out for yourself. Next, we'll go um, and talk about managing Cosmos DB connections in production, where Barrent will give us a quick demo and, and show us some of the best practices. Um, for this. So Baron, you want to share your screen? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, give me one second here. All right. Um, so what I have here is um, a simple application, actually no application at all. I'm just going to initialize a sidecar that loads a Cosmos DB binding uh, output binding. And what I want to show you is I'll be loading 50 instances of a Cosmos DB binding at the same time, more or less, because what we observed is that if you load lots of Cosmos DB side, sidecars or sidecars with Cosmos DB components, doesn't matter which kind, if you're using the same Cosmos DB account, this can be problematic. Uh, and I'll show you exactly how and then how we will work around that, what the best practices are. So let me just do that. Here's my silly uh, bash script to do this. So I'm just gonna launch a bunch of sidecars here on my machine. And until when I get a bunch of errors in a moment, I'll just quit this and, and we can see what is happening. It won't take very long to fail. So you can see uh, here it's failing. This is already good enough. I'm, I can exit this. And then what we can see in here is, let's see, somewhere is an error 429. You can see this, yeah, so here, um, requests did not complete uh, due to metadata requests, uh, something like that. Um, and this is something that happens with Cosmos DB upon initialization of connections. And in fact, if I go to the documentation for Cosmos DB specifically, um, they state that initializing new clients of Cosmos DB fetches a lot of metadata um, and this is known and so, it would be ideal to not initialize lots of clients at the same time. Now, if you have an application with that or lots of sidecars, if they all come up at the same time, maybe that's that could be problematic. So we now publish these best practices here for getting around that. And what we have is a couple of things you can do. The first thing is you can ensure that only, um, only sidecars that really need to load the Cosmos DB components actually do so by scoping components to specific applications. And that can be done like so. In your component definitions, you would just specify this, the scopes parameter here and then list the application. And then additionally, um, what you should be doing ideally is ensuring that you don't deploy everything at the same time that could initialize the Cosmos DB connection so maybe if you have multiple applications that use components, uh, Cosmos DB components, deploy them gradually. Um, don't deploy everything at once, that would help. And additionally, this is another best practice, which may not be applicable in your case, but uh, Cosmos DB shares this metadata request limit at the account level. So a Cosmos DB account can have many da databases in it. But unfortunately, this limit is shared across the entire account. So if possible, unrelated data databases should not live in the same Cosmos DB account to also avoid this issue. Now, on the Dapper side itself, we can do additional things to, to make life better. And so what we're doing is now with the hotfix release 144 and 151 that's coming out in the next couple of days, we will also retry connections. Um, and that actually in, in our uh, testing, um, alleviates this problem where 
in, initially the, the Cosmos DB components may fail to initialize due to this request rate limit issue. Now, to really take advantage of that, though, you do need to update this init timeout value in the component metadata, or not in the metadata, but in the uh, spec. So uh, this section here, um, if I look at the component schema, you can, you can see that again here. And the default value here is five seconds. Um, and the maximum for which we are retrying um, could be retrying is five minutes. That's how it's uh, set up. But you can choose any value you would like to wait. Um, that's entirely up to you. I'm using five minutes in my testing. But configure that value, and then that's the duration for which the component may come up. So for how long you want to wait for the component to come up and the sidecar to be ready. Um, as that de may delay the sidecar to be healthy, um, you may also need to update your, if you use Kubernetes, you may need to update your readiness and liveness probes as well. Um, so that's one consideration uh, to be made here. And these best practices apply to both the Cosmos DB output uh, binding and to the state store components. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Baron. Does anybody have any questions regarding the items that Baron just spoke about? And just a reminder, if you have questions, uh, feel free to post them on the chat window and um, the panel here will answer your questions. All right, if there are no specific questions, around um, best practices with managing Cosmos DB connections. We'll move on to the next segment of our call and that's just the open discussions. Anything uh, you have on your mind, you want to, want to ask, want to discuss, um, this is the time to do so. And again, you can use the chat window to post your question and um, we can go from there. Yeah, I, I actually have something I want to talk about um, with uh, maintainers and approvers here, and that's uh, pub sub retry. So let me just find the issue uh, and I'll share my screen. We have so many issues with uh, the keyword retry in them. Okay, I think I found it. All right, uh, feel free to unmute and uh, let's discuss this. I'm sharing my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Gonna need verbal confirmation. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Right. Yep. Maybe just zoom in uh, slightly. Is this perfect. It? Yep, that's perfect. All right, so uh, the uh, MCRIO with this paw-like avatar here uh, posted um, an issue 20 days ago about a problem in, in subscriptions. So we have uh, Dapper Subscribe, um, which is not available when the set core starts. Um, and th the problem is if the application isn't ready to respond to Dapper Subscribe or um, it's, it's you know, not running yet, um, Dapper will not retry. And even though the app actually meant to subscribe to events, Dapper will continue initialization, um, but the, the, the app will actually uh, not subscribe to any events. And this is um, quite weird because you won't know about it unless you actually put the side current debug level mode uh, where you can see the failure uh, from the subscribe endpoint. Um, and, and this is a problem because it creates an inconsistency in how reliable Dapper is when you're defining topic subscriptions through YAML, um, which always work, and through the Dapper subscribe endpoint, which is really bound to uh, things like you know, your application's readiness and network conditions. So what we've been um, very briefly discussing here 
is that we might want to introduce retries uh, on this endpoint. And at least what I've been thinking is, you know, if we call the Dapper subscribe endpoint on the app itself, and we see any status code which is not 404, because 404 means uh, two things. It means there is an HTTP server that's up and running and it's ready to accept connections. And it also means that the endpoint is not there. So there's nothing to subscribe to. So if we see anything that's not a 404, we basically uh, do an exponential retry, which we're already doing Dapper for some endpoints today. And we can, we can basically retry um, you know, several times just to make the subscription, the programmatic subscription part more reliable. Um, the downside of this is that it will delay initialization um, as far as, you know, for as long as how many exponential retries we actually try, right? So if you try for two and a half seconds, the Dapper sidecar will basically delay itself in, in 2.5 seconds. Um, then again, you know, if your intent was to actually subscribe and your application did take time to respond to the endpoint for whatever reason, um, then it'll prove immensely useful for you because um, it'll, it'll actually subscribe. So I, I wanna get like feedback and, and opinions from other Dapper community members who I know are on the call right now. But does this provide guarantees then that the sidecar won't come up until subscribe is subscribed to or returned? Um, so if we take the exponential back off approach, no, it doesn't guarantee you that that, uh, that Dapper will subscribe if, if you have the endpoint up and running. It'll just mean it'll retry several times until it gave up. That, that sounds very much like just now the Cosmos DB stuff, the net timeout is the same thing, right? And like, they just to delay the time for which the component will try um, initialize, initializing, same thing essentially. Mm -hmm. So could this be governed maybe by the init timeout potentially? Um, the init, so so this is when Dapper calls the app. So how yeah, would you? Is, sorry, so this is on subscribe. Yes. So this is kind of like currently right now. If the app didn't have subscribe or not, it won't return a bad request. It keeps carrying on. Yes. So there is no retry. Correct. So, uh, Bernd, I think you're saying use the init timeout property on the pub sub itself to govern uh, the timeout when calling the subscribe endpoint. Uh, I think you're you might be muted. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. No, uh, no. Yeah. I, remind me, is the um, does sub subscribing happen when the component is initialized, or does it happen? later so subscription happens um i think before the components initialized but this is regardless of the component yeah this is regardless of the component because this is calling on your application this is dapper calling your application I, I was wondering if we should have like um uh, like self-purposed health api for dapper to call into so it's with like maybe even a new api called slash dapper slash health and then dapper would call that so subscribe first and then only then call dapper subscribe yeah so what you're saying is to go this route for the second bullet here when the app is not yet in ready state which is something we don't currently have yeah. uh there is another issue which discusses this i think it's uh this one uh, yeah, so there is this issue that got started way back in March. Um, and this basically discusses um, how Dapper uh, basically finds out that the app is not healthy um, and then makes de decisions based on that. Um, so like the, the discussion here is died down a little, I think. Uh, there is another issue here, let's see. Um, yeah, I actually think this one so this is a PR um, from our friends at Alibaba that actually has Dapper waiting until the app is at starting phase. So we need to look at this PR again. Uh, it actually got closed today because, um, because it was stale. So Dapper bot, naughty Dapper bot closed it. So I reopened this today and I pinged the one effects, but um, like we Dapper maintainers should really uh, look at, at what it's doing because I think this PR is actually setting waiting probes, which basically tell Dapper how to detect when an application is down. Arthur, I see you have a comment here. 
Um, so, you know, if, if this goes in, then uh, yeah, we don't actually need to put any sort of like retries on the Dapper subscribe endpoint um, just because uh, Dapper will, you know, assume that everything that has anything to do with calling the app is ready to go once the app is in ready state. Um, but like solving for this might be much more immediate than waiting for this to happen. Uh, what do you think? Well, don't you need both? Um, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily think so because it's like the responsibility of the app to signal that it's ready. Um, and then, you know, the app basically says to Dapper, hey, all of the endpoints that you're looking to call uh, in my server are ready to be uh, served. You know, they're, they're basically up and running. But how does the app know that? Is that a responsibility of the app writer to say yes. it has to, and okay, so they would have to signal this though to something, yes? Yes, correct. Yeah. And, and that signaling is, is basically implemented in, in this PR. Like what's expected of the app is is in this PR, but we should we should really look at that more. So that's the model of call a health point endpoint on the app several times, and if that's ready, then assuming that the rest of the app is ready for things like subscribe or whatever endpoints that app might call onto. Correct, and you know you can always add exponential retries, um, like you insinuated here. Uh, just, you know, to, to make it more resilient in case there's like a network failure, right? Or a network partition, which yeah. I imagine you won't get if you're running Dapper on localhost, right? Like it's it's the same network uh, interface loop. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't expect these things that, to happen. That, that's why I kind of said both, because like, you know, although you want to have the ready state that, that requires every app now to be able to do that, not to fail, yes? And so you have to go back and retrofit that on every app, yes? Unless there's a, uh, unless we build, I mean, you have to write and rewrite your code, yes? Yeah, yeah. So my, my, my Uber point here is um, this is ongoing work and I think we should get it in. Um, like, I, I think we should have the app be able to tell Dapper that it's ready. Like, this is an important thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it might not happen until, I don't know, I'm just making up, you know, 1.7, 1.8. This thing might be implemented easily for 1.6. So, you know, and if we put this in like the exponential retries, we might decide to remove it or keep it once this goes in. So yeah, but even, even if that goes in, you know, all of the hundreds of apps out there have to go back and retrofit it to in there in order to prevent this from happening. Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, if, if I don't uh, implement code now that turns tells me back I'm ready state in my application I deployed a year ago, um, it's yes, still going to still, yeah. still suffer from this. Correct. That's true. Uh, Arthur, what, what, what do you think? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm inclined towards the having a, uh, the, a separate API instead of using subscribe to, for readiness. Yeah. Okay, but what, what do you think about putting exponential retries temporarily uh, until we have that just to improve the resiliency? Uh, there is a bunch, there's a, a few users that actually reported this. Um, th this user is actually reporting something else. So you can, uh, I, I, I would don't want to say ignore, but like for the context of this session um, issue, that's not what this is about. But there are other users on Discord that, um, reported this thing. So that's why I, I just want to put, you know, exponential retries there. Um, there is, there is, um, so you're, you're right. There, there is an immediate win if you do that. Um, now, are we going to offer this in a, as a configurable option or going to be just using same defaults? Yeah, I, I would, I would opt for same defaults. Um, yeah. That's why I was saying both same defaults on this to fix all the existing apps out there. And then in the future, you can have the actual application that API that gets called, and there you have more control over this if you want. Yeah, I think I think if you think you so the application can uh, not respond reliably when you invoke that even after it's ready. So that is that is a chance that that might happen, right? So um, it's not guaranteed. So um, I think it makes sense. Okay, yeah, cool. So I signed this to uh, 1.6 um, if everyone's okay with this and I send this to myself. 
Um, I'll, I'll try to get in. It should be fairly simple. Like we have several code blocks in Dapper that use uh, exponential backoffs um, for these purposes. So it, it should be fairly easy to add with tests and everything. Yeah, look at the Cosmos DB code I just added, for instance, that one is a good Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely look at that. Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, that's, that's it regarding this issue. Um, back to you, Will. Great, thanks, Jerome. And then it looks like Long might have uh, something to, um, something you want to bring to everyone's attention. Long, I, ma I made you a co-host so you can unmute if you'd like to um, explain it. Oh, this is about uh, distribute lock uh, uh, lock API. I want uh, I want more uh, more people uh, more people see uh, talk about their ideas about this. And then we can push it. So uh, long the the link you put in the chat is for the Dapper standards API. Oh. This is a lot, another thing. This is, uh, I, I share, I share this link is for the distributed lo lock, uh, lock API, a uh, lot for that. Uh, but I want to, uh, want to talk about that too. Okay, so uh, can you put the link to the distributed lock API? And okay. we can, you know. uh, uh, wait a minute. Sorry? Uh, wait a minute. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I can I can try and find it too. Um, hold on, log API. Hopefully, there, okay. Yeah, I, I found it. Let, let me share my screen um, because you're right. We do need to get eyes on that. Yeah. Let me share again. I'm sharing again. Verbal confirmation. Once you can see it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. So. Uh, C flood, uh, I, I think he's from Tencent, um, brought this issue for a distributed lock API, which personally I really want to see happen um, because this can enable things like lead election, right? Think about like an app telling Dapper, hey, I have multiple instances of my app and I want to know which one uh, is the leader now because I'm trying to get a lock on something. So this, this um, proposal here, has a high level design, which uh, is really great. It has a try lock and a non lock API. Um, it, it has a gRPC API uh, again here. I would like to see an HTTP API too, but you know, we can start with gRPC and then translate it to HTTP. Um, and a, a, a bunch of diagrams. Um, and really, what the discussion is, is uh, going after here is. Um, I think CFLED is asking whether or not we need new component types for distributed locks. And at least what I said is, I wanna see this as an added feature on top of state stores, because I don't wanna see you know, an explosion of duplication of code. For example, if you look at the configuration stores now, um, we're seeing that the configuration store for Redis is almost a copy paste of the state store with some changes to it. Um, and I think, you know, if, if we can get um, this capability just added to the state stores, um, we can reuse some of the features like time to live in first rate wins. And, you know, we get consistency with transactions. So um, this is currently where the discussion is at, but please just, you know, like long day request to just review the API and um, make your opinion known because this can be really useful. Um, it's, it's, again, one of those, stateful features that Dapper has. Um, and, and like doing leader election for applications today is extremely complex. No matter what program language you're running in, no matter what environment, it's, it's extremely complex. So if Dapper can make it as simple as a single HTTP or gRPC call to get notified that you have a lock, um, I think this can be um, really useful for developers everywhere. Uh, is, it, is this one that has a lock and then it, the lock expires after a period of time? Yeah, so uh, this proposal um, basically has a time to live um, request here somewhere. Uh, so there's an expiration. So you have like a lock keep alive request uh, with an owner. 
it specifies like who's owning the lock, um, the resource of the lock and the expiration date. It's, it's all part of the uh, API here. Yeah. Great zookeeper like. Yeah, so yeah, this is the trial lock request. The, what I showed earlier was the renewal of the lock. So, you know, this is again like a question do we need a try lock request uh, and a lock capable of request? Or because, like, you have resource ID, lock owner, and expiry here. If we scroll back up, I think it's pretty really similar to the uh, try lock request store name, resource ID, lock owner, and expire. Um, so, you know, Let's, let's also try and keep the, the API surface as simple as possible, not just be the same structure. So those are the kind of things I really want the community's opinion on. You know, um, what's going to be the most developer-friendly API, which is explicit at the same time, I think. Um, but this is a, a really awesome API, and like coding this is going to be lots of fun. Um, and having, you know, more uh, implement like features added to existing state stores, I think will, will be really, really mm -hmm. nice. Like, because if, if, you, if you look at all the dapper state stores today that have like a first write wins, and you can say all of these are actually compliant distributed lock APIs, then you get like seven or eight out of the box. If you were to go into writing new component types for these, you would basically start off with one and you would need to copy paste a, a bunch of stuff and adding new stores will, will be a lot harder and they will need to have their own certification tests. So, you know, I'm really trying to consolidate all of these features on top of existing state stores, uh, which, you know, are building blocks into other uh, APIs too. I think, I think it's, um, um, that's a definitely one of the most requested um, features in Dapper. One thing that I'd like to take this opportunity to remind the contributors is that uh, there's way more to deliver a feature than completing the pull request into the runtime. Uh, you also have to yes. write each UI test. We have to put uh, write components, uh, bring components to a stable version, um, and uh, also by adding them, for example, to certification and conformance test. Uh, also, documentation and SDK. SDK changes to add these features to the SDKs with also corresponding documentation. Um, so I just want to make sure that when somebody brings these proposals, that the person keeps in mind what level of commitment would the person be able to have uh, before we can say we are ready to stick in a new feature like that. Yeah, uh, definitely. Plus one. Okay, um, I'm going to stop sharing. your own and long. And um, for those of you who want to follow along and comment on the, the proposal, the um, issue is linked in the chat window and you can click on it. I think this was a good example, actually, that we also have worth mentioning that we have community call issues open in a Dapper community repo. And if you want to discuss one of these proposals in future, it would be great to put them in there and then people can read them in advance and then you know it'd be great to discuss that so i think that's something i think this is showing a great way of of taking advantage of that and just getting some feedback yep very much so yeah uh hi uh i just want to talk uh talk about uh, the uh uh, the Dapper API, uh, the Dapper API, I do not, uh, I do not see the, the detailed plan about this, but I hear, uh, I heard that uh, Ian has, uh, uh, has, has some thoughts about this, so I want to, I, I, I want to hear, uh, I want to hear that. Ah, uh, you, you, you want to what? Sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 I I uh, I see the since I since I've talked with uh, Young and uh, he uh, he said he has uh, has some plan about the Dapper API. So I want to uh, I want to I want to hear uh, hear his thoughts uh, thoughts about the, the details. Oh okay. So you you're you're referring to the interview I did with InfoQ, I think um, about the CNCF submission and, and the Dapper APIs, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, we have, okay, let me share my screen again. Um, I'm just going to open the link, the first link that you put. Um, let me find that. Yeah, okay, let me share again. Your screen. All right, cool. Um, so we have this feature here, um, this issue here, sorry. It, it, this issue got uh, opened on February 18 by Nobody Jam from, um, I don't remember where he's from. I think, no, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, he uh, opened um, this issue and he basically asked, hey, is the Dapper API gonna get ever separated from the uh, Go implementation itself? So that you know, some cloud providers might decide to have their own implementation, or you know, you might have like a Dapper Edge distribution, um, or something like Envoy could start implementing uh, Dapper APIs through filters or something. And uh, we've had a, a pretty uh, long discussion here. Um, and then you know, once once we got uh, more and more into the CNCF discussions, um, it it looked right to basically make the Dapper APIs uh, a standard um, and to really separate their implementations from uh, from the Go implementation. And, and because that can enable you uh, several things. Um, first, it can much more easily enable other implementations. So for example, you know, think about something like Confluent Cloud, right? Or something like Azure Cosmos DB, and they want to actually offer a Dapper specific endpoint that is a Dapper API compliant, but then it actually talks to the backend service. So something like a separate API might enable that. Um, also, it can bring in much more contributions and uh, community involvement over for an API spec that really uh, develops independently from the implementation. Also, I think it creates much more of, of a healthy uh, relationship in that people think about APIs first and implementation second. Um, and that's basically what I discussed uh, in, in the interview. So now that we're in CNCF, CNCF has this thing called TAGS, um, which are the new name for a ZIG, which is a special interest group. Um, that's basically a group of uh, uh, developers uh, that basically take um, like a subject, like for example, distributed systems APIs, and they sit through a bunch of um, design decisions and try to uh, bring something to become a standard or, you know, an implementation for one of the projects that the CNCF governs. Um, now with Dapper and CNCF, um, there's lots of specifications inside of CNCF. The requirement for having a specification in CNCF is that you have at least one implementation out there, uh, which is, I think, also in CNCF. So if we decide to separate the Dapper APIs now, um, it will fulfill the requirement of a specification inside of the CNCF. Um, and what can happen there is that we basically start to talk to other projects and other developers from, uh, from other projects and um, really bring you know, more eyes into these APIs um, rather than you know, dapper the implementation itself. So you know, if someone from OpenTelemetry, for example, wants to start working on you know, what it would be like for an API for developers to um, emit telemetry to a sidecar and what that's going to be like, it's going to be very easy to do there without the open telemetry, you know, maintainer, for example, needing to know or care about the Dapper implementation specifically. Um, so, you know, that's personally what I would want to see, you know, going forward. Of course, this is all subject to uh, Dapper maintainers and Dapper steering committee uh, thinking this is the right move. So I think we might bring this to the Dapper Steering Committee uh, at some point in the future. Um, that's in any case what I'm thinking about. I would really love to hear about others' opinions. Yeah, no, um, makes sense. Uh, as the, do you have to, the special interest groups can be formed by anyone? So uh, in, in terms of Dapper, uh, we don't have ZIGs today, but like if, if there were one, uh, the steering committee would need to approve it. Um, the special interest group, the special interest group itself would comprise all of the interested people. 
um, and then they would work with maintainers and the steering committee to bring their recommendations, right? So for example, the special interest group would include anyone interested in forming the first draft of the standard APIs. Then this group would basically bring the draft to the DAPR maintainers and, and steering committee. Uh, and then a decision could be taken, you know, about whether or not we think this draft is, is really applicable to be the first version of the, the DAPR APIs. And this is how it would work. Um, this, this is how special interest groups generally work in most open source projects. And would, and, uh, would this uh, spec uh, or draft uh, be an extraction of our existing APIs, or it can be also different with like breaking changes and things like that? Yeah, so um, good, very good question, which was also asked here. Um, in my opinion, uh, it would be based on, on the existing APIs. Since Dapper has reached 1.0 and we have backward compatibility guarantees, um, we cannot, in my opinion, change the existing APIs. But, you know, since we already support introducing new APIs, any changes we want to make will be the basis of new versions of those APIs. So if during the specification standard, you know, we go like, hey, we actually want to change the state API to be something different, then this calls for a V2 of the state API, um, which might be incorporated into the specification from the beginning. Okay. Um, and uh, do you have any idea if this spec will be um something uh language uh, protocol specific or it's going to be protocol agnostic um the reason i'm asking is uh an api describing http api is very different from describing a grpc api and some specs they they abstract that out by just using a, a common concepts at a high level spec first before they describe each protocol yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I haven't given it much thought. Um, if, if we can come up with a way to describe something that HTTP and uh, gRPC can then derive from, then I think that I think that's the preferred way to go. I, I really like the um, cloud event spec in that regard because it has a general purpose specification um, and then it has uh, uh, I will call sub specifications. Like, here's how you do a uh, uh, cloud event with JSON. Here's how you do cloud event with XML. Here's how you do cloud event with Avro and so forth. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. We we might want to see something similar, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing now. But uh, again, this is this is important. Like, it, it's it's not a like a now thing. You know, it's not a specific feature in Dapper. It's not, it's not a bug fix. Um, but this is really, I think, the, the future um, of the project because this is going to enable much more rapid iterations uh, on the APIs themselves. Um, and so, yeah, this is definitely something for uh, everyone to get involved with. And again, like I, I mentioned, the special interest group um, somewhere here. Uh, and if anyone wants to be part of this, then just uh, respond on, on the issue and we can start forming the, the group that's going to be responsible for driving this um, to steering committee and maintainers. Perfect. Thank you, Yaron. All right, uh, we're right at time. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining the call. And we'll hope to see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.